Hey everyone, this is Scott with Show Me Solo. Today I'm going to bring you a solo gameplay overview of Hermagore Market. This is a print and play roll and write game. It's designed by Emmanuel Ornella and published by Mind the Move Games. This game was successfully launched on Kickstarter about a month ago, but you can now purchase this um, widely on the Mind the Moves website. The cost is just over $5 US, and uh, for what we'll talk through today, it's a really, really great value. Um, purpose of this game is that you will be rolling three dice to acquire goods throughout the markets, and then you will travel to different towns, and based on what they are looking to purchase on these scrolls, you will sell the goods, and the goal of the game is to make the most money by selling the most goods. So this game plays one to infinite players, essentially. Uh, the solo mode is beat your own score, but uh, the real clever thing that the, des uh, the designer and the publisher did here was to make this infinitely playable, but also add so much variability and replayability. Uh, because when you purchase this game from the website, you won't just get a file to download and print off. You're going to get access to the website, and then you will generate the player sheets whenever you want to play for as many players as you have. And after I talk through uh, the rules and do a quick overview of the gameplay, uh, at the end of the video, we'll talk about the essentially infinite replayability here, because every time you generate a new sheet... Almost everything you see has the possibility to change. So the various goods that you're acquiring, the goods that you're selling, the costs to travel. Uh, we'll talk all about that after I explain the rules uh, at, at the very end of the video. It's really, really clever, and it's made this game really enjoyable the more and more times I've played. So let's talk about how we play. So we are starting off in the castle. And this game is played over 15 turns during which we are going to be acquiring goods. And those are indicated by the white squares here. And then at various points, there's some other actions we need to take. So after we go through some rounds of acquiring goods, we will do a travel phase, a collect income phase, and a maintenance phase. So um, we'll talk about the acquiring goods phase and some of the iconography first. I'll play a couple of rounds and uh, then we'll just talk about the scoring and then the, the variability as I mentioned. So the way we play the game is by rolling three dice. And based on the numbers of the dice, we will be acquiring the goods using two of the dice for the rows and the columns. So matching up the numbers, for instance, two and two, we would be acquiring peppers from this stall. If it were two and four, we would be acquiring books from here. Four and two, books from here, so on and so forth. The third die is used for the amount of goods we're going to acquire in the specific stall. So here, if we were going to the stall with these books, we would acquire two of the books. Now, every time we acquire goods, we increase their value on the stock exchange. So no matter how many goods we acquire, just at each of the 15 acquire goods turns, we look at the good that we are acquiring and cross off the lowest number on the respective good in the stock exchange. And what that's going to do is obviously increase the cost of goods when they're sold. And that comes into play when we get to the travel and income phase, at which time we will be starting on the castle, deciding where within the city we wanna travel, going to specific towns and selling the specific goods required on the scrolls. So obviously, we then determine our strategy to see where we want to travel to, which helps dictate which goods we hopefully can acquire by the roll of the dice and hopefully increase the value 
uh, based on what we see in the scroll. So there's a lot of um, thinkiness and strategy going into this game in, in just 15 turns, which, which goes by really, really quickly. So uh, one quick thing before we acquire some goods, had we not liked any of the individual die dice. So let's say there was, um, let's use this, well, I'm trying to find a good example. Uh, I don't know. I'll, we'll just use this. So the two and a four, I, and let's say I roll, I roll the two. This is actually a good example. I would be able to acquire two goods within this stall. But if I wanted to acquire more, I could use, I could take this two and use any available dice manipulators here to turn this two into anything that's currently available. So this has four open slots to acquire the books. So I would mark off this four and use this as a four. Now in solo, I could flip it to the, to the value, but if other people are playing, I wouldn't have to flip it because others would use this as a two, I would use it as a four. So just as an example. Um, but what I'll do is, actually for sake of example, I'll just con I'll keep it like this. So I'm using the two and the four, and now I can acquire two goods within this stall here. So I have now two books available to me when I decide to travel and sell. Now, the rules about the stalls are once you acquire any amount of goods in them, whether you fill the stalls or not, you may not return back here. So even though there are two available books to be acquired, I can never use this combination to go back here. So this stall is essentially closed off to me throughout the remainder of the game, which is why these dice manipulations come into handy. Um, so that's that turn. That was the one. And now since I acquired books, I will come over here and raise their cost on the stock exchange. So now we start round two, or turn two. And a five, a four, and a one. Uh, let's see. So now maybe let's start thinking about where we're eventually going to travel to once we do the first four acquired goods phases. Uh, so, when we travel, we start at the castle and we could go to any number of cities to stop and try to sell the goods. But wherever we travel to, we have to pay the cost that is on the dotted line travel space. So, if I go just to this one city, that would cost me six when I get to the travel. But if I want to continue to a different city, I have to go in order. I can't just go there some other way. So if I wanted to go here, it would cost me 6 plus 7, 13. And at the end game scoring, we're essentially going to add up all of our income from goods sold, subtract from that the cost that we traveled and the cost of the maintenance for the goods in the stalls, which we'll get to in a second. And if we have any dice manipulation still unused, we would add that to our total. So you really have to factor in how far you're traveling to try to make the most of the goods you're going to sell. Uh, and then we'll talk about maintenance in a minute. So um, let's just say for this example, we're going to go to the cheapest travel next town over. And when we get here, they're going to want some diamonds, a chili pepper, a coffee, and some gold. So uh, let's see if we can do this to get some diamonds. Uh, okay. So we can do a one, a four, and use the five for this stall here. Now, if you rolled a six during the acquired goods phase, a six is wild. So it could account for any row or column, or any, or up to six goods. Um, so I'm going to do the one and the four and get the diamonds. Now, I had a five, but this stall only had four, so I don't get credit for anything extra. You just lose anything extra you don't use. Um, otherwise, if you don't have enough like here, you just wouldn't fill the stall. So I acquired the diamonds, and I raised the price on the exchange. So next I'm looking for ooh, a pepper, coffee, or gold. All right, there 
is the six, one, and a three. So let me just do this. One, I'm gonna use this six as a one and use the three to fill that stalls with pepper and mark that off there. And now we start the fourth acquired bits phase. One, two, and a five. So I need either coffee or gold if I can get that, um, which I can get here, one and a two, but with a five, I'm gonna be missing out there. Uh, likewise, if I did a two and a five, I'm only gonna do one gold, and I only need one gold. You know, for sake of example, I'm gonna do this. Now, I would always try to fill up the amount of goods per stall if I could, but this will make for a good example. So I have the one gold there, and I raise the price of gold. Now, that is the first four acquired goods phase. Now we're going to do the travel phase. So you do not have to travel if you don't want to. However, since I'm starting at the castle, the only way you could sell goods is by stopping in a town that has goods available to sell. But if I wanted to stay here after this turn for the next turn, I certainly could. I don't have to travel. But since I'm traveling here, it's gonna cost me two. And now it is the income phase. So the way you sell the goods is you look at the goods that are being requested on the particular scrolls. Now, to fulfill the sale, you need to sell an entire scroll in its entirety. So what that means is I can't just sell a coffee and a pepper and come back for the diamond. To get the income, I need to sell all three or however many goods are within each scroll. Um, I don't have to sell, I don't have to fulfill both scrolls, but on a single scroll, I need to be able to sell all the goods. And the way you sell the goods is by looking at what you've acquired, and when you sell them, you could take them from any available slot. So they don't all have to come from this one or that one, you know, you could use them individually. So let me just see what I could sell here. Now, I don't have any coffee, so I cannot sell anything on that scroll, but this one, I could spend one gold and two diamonds, which I have. Now, had I had, you know, one left here and other diamonds here, I could spend the one and take it from another stall. That's perfectly fine. So I've fulfilled that order, if you will, and now I look at how much income I made, which is based on the stock market. So I sold one gold, which is worth two, and two diamonds, which are worth two each. So two, four, and six. So since I've stopped there, I can no longer travel. You only travel once as far as you want to go, but you must stop in a town to sell the goods. So in that income phase, I only get six. Now this brings us to the maintenance phase. So the way maintenance works is for any stall that you have unused goods. So this one is a full stall, but it's goods that have not been sold as is this one, as is this one. Now this one has goods sold, but it's still an open stall. Um, you need to pay the cost shown next to that stall every time you get to the maintenance phase. So right now, my maintenance cost would be one plus two plus two plus three, which is four, seven, eight. Now that is a high cost. What you can do to offset this cost is at any point during the maintenance phase, essentially cross out an entire stall, rendering it no longer of use. So let's look at this one, for example. Remember, when acquiring goods, once you acquire any amount of goods in a stall, I can never go back to that. So for the example, I only acquired one good here. So this is now unuseful for me for the rest of the game. So I'm actually just going to cross that out so I no longer need to pay the maintenance because I can no longer use that ever again. Um, now I have a decision for the others. This one I marked off half. I might want to keep that depending on where I'm traveling. You know, I could use one there, maybe go there. But let's say I just didn't want 
to ever use those two again, which if I left the stall open, I could use those. But to save the maintenance costs, I'm just gonna cross that out. So this pepper is unused in this stall. I'm gonna to wanna to leave that because I really didn't use any. And this one, even though I can't go here again, I didn't use any of the books and I could possibly travel here and use two of those books. So I'm gonna to wanna to keep that available for potential future sales. So during this maintenance phase, my cost would be one plus two and three. And play is gonna continue that way until you get to the end, where again, you add up your income, subtract from it any of your travel, any of your maintenance, and then add the sum of any of the available dice modifiers that you have left. And that's really it. So let me show you an example of some of the variations that I talked about before. So as I said, when you purchase this, you get access to the website, you generate a new sheet. A um, Couple things you'll notice right off the bat. First, if you didn't have any dice available to you, you could add in the 15 dice rolls for all the acquired good phases, which is really, really cool. If you're traveling, you just don't have access to dice, they make that so easy and available. Uh, additionally, there's no numbers on the roads for the travel costs. Um, if you don't want them randomly generated before each game, someone could roll the dice to fill in the numbers of each of these roads equating to the travel costs. Um, as I said, every time you generate, you notice the goods are all different. The number of scrolls stay the, stay the same. The, the number of the goods needed in, in each scroll, I believe, stays the same, but all of the goods themselves are different. And individually down in the stalls in the market, all the goods are different. Now, the maintenance numbers stay the same, um, but one additional variant you can do is have a non-linear market where um, when you normally generate it, there are five of each goods. It's a five by five grid, so there will be five of each good type. If you do a non-normal or non-linear, you might have four of one type and six of another and then five and five and five. So it makes some goods more scarce, which could help or work against you based on how the, the uh, scrolls and the goods are generated. Another variation or variant is a nonlinear stock exchange. So here, all the numbers are, there, are one through six for each of the goods, but they're different here. So it adds a little more strategy in terms of what you want to acquire and then hopefully sell for more money. Uh, the last thing, not shown here, there is a thief variant, which adds a thief action at the end of each of, of these other turns, where if you're playing multiplayer, you have the opportunity to steal goods from the opponents on your left and right. And if you're playing solo, there's a way that you handle that as well based on how your stock exchange is set up. So uh, again, tons and tons of replayability variation here. This has been so enjoyable. Um, I've only played solo thus far, but I could easily see myself playing this um, at a game night, even over Zoom, because you really only need one person with dice or not even, you just have one person to be in control of the player sheet with the dice on them. So uh, that is it. I appreciate you watching this video. Um, I'm gonna leave links in the description to the website and other information if you wanna purchase this game. And I hope you come back for some more solo gameplay videos. Until next time, thanks.